All right, so I think we're at a good number, so we can get started. So hi, everyone. So my name is Jake. I'm the Senior Education Coordinator here at Waterfront Alliance, and thank you so much for joining us today for this panel, Educating Future Climate Leaders, the Landscape of Climate Education in New York. Um, so just a little background on myself, I run our Estuary Explorers Environmental Education Program, where we directly connect students and teachers across New York City uh, with their local accessible waterfront. Uh, joining us today for this panel um, is Emily Fano, the Senior Manager of Climate Resilience Education at the National Wildlife Foundation, um, Ellie Kareff, the Teaching Curriculum Specialist at Billion Oyster Project, uh, Akila Lewis, an Environmental Educator at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, and Jennifer Bombardier, uh, the Education Manager at the Lower East Side Ecology Center. Um, so for Climate Week, the Waterfront Alliance has been centering around critical uh, climate resilience issues facing New York City. Uh, we do this through a series of webinars, such as the one you're at now, uh, roundtable discussions, art exhibits, boat tours, coastal cleanups, and more. Uh, we welcome you to visit our website and the Climate Week website to learn more about events this week. Um, so as I mentioned, today's webinar is titled Educating Future Climate Leaders. Um, our panelists will discuss the current landscape of climate education um, across New York, uh, the challenges to implementing climate-focused curriculum, um, and policy recommendations to mandate a climate curriculum in our schools, and not at not just the city level, but also the statewide level as well. Um, so with that being said, uh, we can get into the first question, which just goes into introductions of our panelists. Um, so we can start out with Akila. So just for the question, as we begin, please help us understand the work that each of you does in supporting youth by explaining what organization you represent, uh, what your role is, and then what are some of the goals you have for climate education for this school year? Yes, thank you, Jake, and good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Akila Lewis. I'm an environmental educator with the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. And I work within the education office and we work to educate thousands of students. We work with teachers as well as the public to convey um, the mission of the Department of Environmental Protection. So our mission is to enrich the environment and protect the public health for all New Yorkers by providing high quality drinking water, managing wastewater and stormwater, and reducing air hazardous noise waste, hazardous air noise and hazardous waste. And so we do many guided tours of our Newtown Creek wastewater resource recovery facility. We do public outreach events and we work with formal and non-formal educators in professional learning opportunities, as well as doing virtual outreach to all five boroughs, as well as the New York City watershed. So even tomorrow, we have a non-formal bus tour where we're going upstate to the watersheds that we're going to take some educators there to see the impacts of climate change, as well as water use in our watershed system. Excellent, thank you, Akila. And let's pass it over to Ellie. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been on that bus tour and it's fabulous. Highly recommend all of the, the bus tours from the DEP. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, all of the professional development. Um, so my name is Ellie Kareff. I am the Teaching and Curriculum Specialist at Billion Oyster Project. And um, so after working with students, uh, doing direct student services and field trips for almost 10 years, I joined Billion Oyster Project last year to work on writing curriculum and doing professional development with teachers. So um, in terms of what we do to um, support climate education, um, first of all, all of our curriculum is available on our website and it's free for anybody who wants it. So it's open source, open access for anyone. And um, we are also, uh, we actually have one curriculum unit that revolves around climate change specifically. So that's our, um, it's not it's not a climate change unit, but it is the Living Breakwaters curriculum, which is a project in Southern Staten Island um, that's actually building living breakwaters using live oysters and many other organisms and rocks and sand and lots of things um, that are 
in the process of being built. And this is a curriculum that's been available for a number of years on our website. But uh, this year, we're actually starting to highlight that program more. The Living Breakwaters is close to done, and they actually just won an award um, for the architecture of it this past week, which is really exciting. Um, and the program, the, the unit itself, talks about adaptation and mitigation of climate change, um, the history and the present of the living breakwaters, and also vulnerable species that live on or near the living breakwaters. And in addition to the curriculum unit we have on our website, we are going to provide a pr professional development workshop for teachers later this year in December. And again, all of this information is on our website that will be going through some of the parts of Living Breakwaters that could be useful for students. And actually this Saturday, Saturday we're joining um, the architects Scape, who designed uh, the Living Breakwaters on a shoreline walk. So if anyone is interested in coming with us on Saturday afternoon um, to go check out this project, you are all invited. Um, and let's see if I Let's, let, let's keep it at that for now, so. Thanks. Excellent, thank you, Ellie. And to all the panelists, if you have any other events coming up, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We'd love to circulate them around. Um, yeah, let's go over to Emily next. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much to the Waterfront Alliance for hosting us and inviting me to participate in this. Um, as Jake said, I lead climate and resilience education programs for the National Wildlife Federation in New York and also nationally. And um, I co-created and now co-manage a program called the Resilient Schools Consortium. Um, and it educates middle and high school students about climate science, climate impacts like sea level rise and erosion, um, climate justice, um, and the natural and built solution, solutions that incre increase climate resiliency in our city. Um, we explore um, structural racism like redlining that leads some frontline communities to be more vulnerable to climate impacts than others. Um, we bring students on shoreline walks. We've been working in Coney Island for the past few years, and we bring them on shoreline walks um, to really understand what the concept of resiliency means. I think that's a concept that most kids don't really um, get in school that are not very familiar with that concept. We teach them certain terms like um, riprap and um, groin and scarp and um, even erosion, which seems to be uh, something that most people would know about, but really isn't discussed in school. Um, we help students use digital tools to visualize sea level rise and other impacts in, the com in their communities. Um, and then we engage them in service learning projects like dune restoration and tree planting, which mitigate the impacts of coastal flooding, um, urban heat island, and so on. And then we we also in help them com connect with community members because RISC is really becoming a community engagement program, connecting schools um, to community members um, to create kind of intergenerational social resilience in communities. Um, we also are very pleased about the fact that evaluation is showing that this model is really this which is an, has an action oriented curriculum is really empowering so rather than doom and gloom which a lot of climate stuff um you know carries with it that students feel empowered by this by this program um and it helps them feel like they're doing something in their local community to um you know deal with the impacts of of climate change locally so we're very pleased about that and then in addition, um, I co-manage the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force, which is also an intergenerational body. We have um, a cohort of high school students and a youth steering committee that are mentored to advocate for their own climate education. They've met with policymakers in the mayor's office, the governor's office, the board of ed, the board of regents to um, make the case that they need more climate education because we know the students are only getting about one or two hours of that a year. So um, the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force hosts public events. Um, you know, we provide resources for teachers um, and uh, we're having a meeting October 11th, which I can put in the chat later on that we would invite everyone to participate in. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Emily. And then I'll pass it off to Jennifer now. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Bombardier. I'm the Education Manager at the Lower East Side Ecology Center. So grateful to be here this afternoon and just really excited to dive into this conversation. Um, I've been working with the Ecology Center for about two and a half years now, managing our environmental education programs. 
For those who aren't familiar, the Ecology Center has been operating in the Lower East Side for about 35 years now um, with the mission of just giving New Yorkers tools to help build a more sustainable city. And we primarily do this through, um, through like our waste programs. Our largest program is our community composting um, where we do composting, uh, processing, as well as compost education. We do electronic waste recycling stewardship of local green spaces and environmental ed. And um, so as the education manager, I develop and facilitate programs for folks of all ages. So not just youth, but we also work with adults and older adults. And that includes our food justice programming that we offer in partnership with Henry Street Settlement, um, where we offer um, education and gardening and food experiences for student groups, for older youth, and for seniors. We do estuary and waterfront education for the public, including fishing clinics, as well as um, partnering with local schools for Dan the Life of the Hudson River, which is coming up in two weeks. I'm sure many of you are participating in that one. We also do street tree stewardship and um, education for public and community groups. And then one of our newer projects that I'm really excited about and I'm kind of focusing on using this lens for this conversation today is um, our professional development program for teachers. So we are participating in the Parks for Every Classroom project with the National Park Service. And we have partnered with the African Burial Ground National Monument in Lower Manhattan, um, as well as with Peck Slip School to develop teacher uh, professional development experiencing experiences focusing on equity-centered uh, climate change education, really using an interdisciplinary approach that is grounded in the history of New York City and Manhattan. Um, and so that's our kind of biggest like upcoming project that I'm really excited about uh, continuing to develop in this in this new year. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. And just as a quick reminder to our panelists, I can see all of these wonderful events that you're bringing up. Um, I can see them in the chat in my end. I'm not sure if everyone else on the attendee side can see that. Um, so I just uh, asked if you can go to the chat settings and just change it to uh, host and panelists to everyone. Uh, that would be great. Um, so yeah, we can start diving into our four main questions. And just as a reminder to everyone who's on the attendee side, um, we're going to take about 40 minutes for four questions, and then we're going to have a eight to 10 minute Q&A session at the end. Um, I do ask that you save your questions for that time, as we won't really be able to go through the chat um, while the panelists are answering them. Um, so with that being said, let's get started with the second question, which what have been some of the biggest challenges you have faced in implementing climate education into your existing programs? Um, does anyone want to take the lead on this question? I could start off. Um, just something that um, I've shared with this group already, but something that I've noticed in our professional development program for teachers, working with schools and talking with educators who really value um, climate justice education, they see the need really clearly, they know it's important, they want it, but teachers being pulled in a lot of different directions and really having a full plate, um, it's really hard to get attendance at these programs um, when there are so many just competing priorities that teachers really face. You know, we can offer stipends for attendance, we offer CTLE credits for attendance, we offer snacks and, um, you know, whatever it really takes. And you get really excited signups and then getting people to show up when there's so many just competing priorities on teachers' plates has been a, has been a, big, a big challenge. And I think from the um, nonprofit standpoint, funding is always a challenge as well. So really, you know, making sure that we have quality curriculum that to share takes a lot of money. Um, so the, our model for writing curriculum um, uses 
time from, you know, staff time from, from me and my partner to actually write curriculum. And then we pay teachers to um, pilot the curriculum with their students and actually do lessons in their classroom and take that time and then also take the time to give us feedback on those lessons so that we can incorporate edits into the curriculum and then publish the curriculum. Um, so that generally takes like a one to two year, that's a, a one to two year process. And you know we wanna make sure that it's well-funded. So um, thinking about how we can how we can get appropriate funding for a project like that while also keeping up all of the other projects that we're working on in our organization can also be a challenge. And I think um, personally, you know, I think Emily spoke to this a little bit, the uh, often climate change education focuses a lot on the doom and gloom and that is, can, that can be a very depressing way to teach about our reality and future, right, our present and future. So, you know, thinking about creative ways to to sort of reframe climate education as, into something more empowering for students. And then I think lastly, um, you know, just making sure that we don't rewrite, reinvent the wheel, right? So there is a lot of really good climate education and curriculum out there already. And so we, we really need to take the time to parse through and make sure that what we're adding to the pot is useful and unique um, and it's not just sort of reiterating something that Jen or Akila or Emily is already doing so you know fi figuring out how that all fits in yeah I would I would also add in uh, and I love what everyone is saying um, you know as as we have um, found um, first of all we know that climate education is not fully in the standards the way that it should be and so it's really always an add-on. Um, there are passionate teachers that are absolutely doing it. And we did a survey in partnership with the, um, the task force, did a survey with the United Federation of Teachers back in 2021. And we got over 1500 responses. And what we found, which is not surprising, um, is that 68% of teachers lack the time to teach about climate change, not because they don't want to, but because they just are being pulled in a million directions has been said before. Um, and that they acknowledge that it's not part of the standard, so they just don't have time to do it. 80% um, of teachers didn't have climate change covered in their pre-service courses, which means when they're studying to be teachers, it's not really covered. Um, and then 52% um, of teachers said they teach about it, um, in, but in 81% do so in a core class, but only like one to two hours per school year because it's mostly taught in science and mostly for middle and high school students. Um, and so even though 73% of teachers said that they know climate change will hurt future generations, they're very frustrated about the fact that they, most of them had not attended a training, a teacher training on it. And um, again, they just feel like they have too much on their plate. Um, so it is always an add on um, for most teachers that we have encountered, um, unless like they take on our program, um, they can teach it, you know, during the school year, but still it is a challenge to fit it in. And I agree that funding is always, um, is always a need and a challenge. I think education, especially climate in the climate space is not very well funded. Um, and certainly funders need to be educated about how important it is, um, for, for future generations. Yeah. And, um, I think, from DEP, we have an interesting challenge is that our education office is such a small team in a very large government agency of like almost 6,000 employees. So sometimes it's very difficult or challenging to gather the information from our colleagues who are working hard on essential, you know, um, needs like, you know, delivering water, drinking water to people in New York City, you know, them coming to us is kind of like, you know, a side project. So it's really important that we're able to reach our colleagues and assist the public with knowing what is going on and what is being updated within climate change for New York City. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for all of these answers. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep us moving into the next question. Um, so this question kind of focuses on complementing each other's work. Um, I know I've I've worked in the nonprofit space for just shy of about 10 years now, 
Um, I know some of the most common complaints that I hear and that I've experienced have been that we're all trying to work towards the same goal, um, yet oftentimes we're competing for the same resources, whether that be funding, maybe that's, you know, working with, you know, different, like the same school or the same groups. Uh, but I've found within the education space, and especially through the environmental education space, um, that there's more of like a complementary feeling, there's more of a collaboration feeling to it. Um, and panelists, feel free to disagree with me at any point on that. Uh, but this next question is, how do you feel that the work that each of you does complements each other and fills the void of not having mandated climate education in schools in New York? Um, this is something I'm really excited to actually talk about because, you know, like Ellie was saying, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are so many opportunities for uh, for students and for teachers to get access to like really meaningful um, climate education in New York City. There are so many sites that are hosting field trips. There are so many groups that are developing curriculum. And so I feel really grateful for this large network that we have and that I can actually connect educators um, with resources that may be more relevant to the specific themes that they're learning about in the classroom or um, that are more local for them. I have teachers reach out that want to come on a field trip to our site, you know, but they live somewhere in the Bronx where they're bringing their students on a two hour bus ride. And so how can I connect them with a resource that's more local, more relevant um, and a better use of their resources. And so I really, just appreciate that. Something that I have been working on is a little bit of a project for our professional development program is um, compiling some of these resources that we can share with teachers. Um, I already do it very informally, just through emails and sending them links. Um, but how can we create like a central, you know, kind of database of sorts that, you know, teachers can use? Um, because some of us are also very small and have limited capacity in what we can offer. Uh, students. I'd also add, not to like hog this question, um, but something I really appreciate about the Parks for Every Classroom program is how it um, emphasizes these relationships between uh, national park sites, community-based organizations, and teachers, recognizing that teachers know their students well, community-based organizations know their um, communities really well, um, and park staff know their resources. And so the most meaningful programming is when it is developed as a partnership. Can I jump in really quickly to like jump off that? Cause I, I totally agree with what Jennifer was saying. And we try to lift up other um, organizations, resources and events um, whenever we can. And we can't do the work that we do, especially as part of the risk program without partners. And we rely on partnerships um, to deliver our, our services. So for example, the American Literal Society, we work with really closely to deliver seining and ecology walks. Um, we partner with the New York City Parks because they are the landowners on which our students plant dune grasses. Um, and we always refer folks um, to other groups um, when we can't service them in a specific neighborhood. Like Jennifer said, if we have a group in the Bronx, but they can't make that to our bus ride to Coney Island to plant dune grasses, we'll refer them to um, another organization you know, in their area. So totally agree and support that kind of partnership and collaboration. Yes, and I, I agree. I think the DEP's work goes hand in hand with almost all the other, you know, city agencies and, you know, nonprofit groups and organizations because we're the city's governing agency for the environment. And we strive to create those like professional learning opportunities, like I mentioned, programs and many, many resources so that the public can have our information and have this information so educators can have a resource that they can build curriculum from. Like in our curriculum guide, we have a climate change education module that we worked on with the mayor's office. And so we want to we want these resources to be able to not just support the public, but also to our partners so that they can reach their audiences. And even right now, I've been gathering some information from 
some of the panelists, organizations, and others for a Jamaica Bay Educators Resource Guide. So, you know, compiling this information so that we can share it out. And lastly, and very quickly, Jake, I promise, um, our curriculum is really student inquiry focused and driven. And so it's really um, thinking about how where students want to take their questions and and what types of projects they're interested in investigating so you know we've had um students focus on you know oyster reef growth and also you know public health and air quality in their apartment building actually in the bronx and so really thinking about um by by working with teachers to empower their students to, to investigate these questions on their own, then we can have a um, more woven fabric of climate change education from you know, students. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, from the top down teacher expert uh, experience. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you for all of those answers. Um, yeah. So we can we can jump into the next one. And before we get into the next question, um, which is focused on New York City's initiative of Climate Action Days, if anybody's familiar, I just want to go into a little bit of background on what those are. Um, so for anyone who hasn't heard, Climate Action Days are part of Initiative 28 set up by Mayor Adams. Uh, essentially, the goal of this is to launch climate education and training programs for DOE schools. Um, these climate action days are meant to be a school-wide effort and a chance to highlight existing programs. Uh, so this could mean uh, a school partnering with an organization, uh, maybe about topics around climate resilience, maybe about topics around advocacy or food justice, and then having students doing a project that benefits the school, um, maybe through doing something like setting up a rating system for how the school handles compost or handles recycling. Um, so there are set to be four climate action days throughout this school year. Um, the first one is to take place on Wednesday, December 6th, uh, focused on the topic of energy. The second, February 7th, focused on waste. Uh, the third, April 17th, focused on green spaces and health and wellness. And then the last one on Wednesday, June 12th, focused on water. Um, there will also be trainings coming up for this, which we can also put more info in the chat about. Um, but just on the topic of Climate Action Days, um, these days are New York City's first steps uh, towards mandated climate change education. Um, so to the panelists, could you please share how you see your work with whatever organization or agency you work with? Um, how do you see your work fitting into the rollout of these days? And then share some of your first impressions of it. I can take a stab at this. Um, so I, you know, we disseminated some resources through the DOE that schools can use this year. And I've already um, talked about our Living Breakwaters curriculum and our professional development this December. So um, I, you know, even though that's gonna be the, I think the day before the um, energy day, climate action day, um, I think that's, still going to, you know, that's definitely part of the relevant resources that we offer. Um, and we are also offering other trainings this year, uh, including the uh, fields professional learning training, which will be at the end of this month to uh, help teachers feel more comfortable getting students out to the waterfront and teaching in the field. And so I think that in really, you know, is relevant in terms of teaching about climate change so that again thinking about local action like jennifer was talking about earlier um you know getting teachers more comfortable with their communities and with exploring with their students and feeling like they have the capacity to be able to do that um and um we're also you know we have a couple of events in june um surrounding the water climate action day which will be our student symposium is actually May 31st this year so that students can present on projects related to water um, and or oysters and or environmental justice around uh, in New York City. And um, also we're gonna have on the first chancellor's or 
the Chancellor's Day in the first week of June um, for teachers to come learn about the Boiling Oyster Project and, and the resources that we offer for teachers. So it's again, it's not entirely like specifically climate related, but because all of these things revolve around climate and because we're an organization that does work uh, with New York Harbor, in New York Harbor and thinking about water, um, I think these are, these are uh, good parts that fit into the climate action days. And of course, you know, I think um, it's a great first step, but, you know, thinking about the work that Emily's talking about, um, you know, we, uh, well, we can talk about that more, but just thinking about, you know, I think getting that beyond that first step of not just climate action days, but climate curriculum is gonna be really important for our future and sustainability of New York City. Yeah, totally agreed. And I just wanted to mention that our students in our task forces youth steering committee actually lobbied the mayor's office for climate education to be incorporated into Plan YC. And we're thrilled that for the first time, um, the city strategic plan includes 10 pages devoted to climate education and work, green workforce development, which is a historic first. Um, our task force in 2018 lobbied for that and got like a little paragraph. Um, and now we have 10 pages. So um, we're excited to see how it all develops. And um, kind of like what um, Ellie said, you know, just like Earth Day is every day, is, should really be every day. We want to see climate action um, happen every day. And so that's what we're trying to do by offering, you know, programs like the RISC program, which are year-long programs, um, and mentoring youth as part of our um, youth steering committee to kind of advocate for their own climate education, you know, so that it becomes something that's embedded in their curriculum and not something that, you know, is a one-off thing. Um, it's still a great first step and, you know, we'll certainly support it and um, have also provided resources to the Department of Ed um, to distribute to teachers. We have a you know, schoolyard habitats guide, which um, helps students create wildlife gardens. We have um, resources on energy and um, zero waste and all that. So we're we're happy to support, um, of course, the initiative um, in any way that we can. And I think at DEP, um, a lot of the themes for the climate action days are related to our wastewater facilities or some of the programs we already do day to day. And so we're excited to be able to support schools and educators as they are able to maybe host their own projects at their schools or even come to us for a field trip. And so these are you know free field trips available to schools within New York City. And then they can also um, you know join in our art and poetry um, contest where we have different themes related to water or climate change, where students across New York City and our watershed schools can create art and enter this contest showing how they feel about climate change or water or their natural resources. Yeah, I guess I just um, I don't have anything totally new to add other than what everybody else said. I think it's a really great start at really engaging students. And I, I think it's, it's always fun when there's like kind of a dedicated day where we know everybody's kind of doing something similar, like day in the life. It's really exciting for students to know that they're kind of part of this like, you know, bigger um, event where students um kind of all over are engaging in the same kind of work and it really is like we're all in this together um so I think there's just a nice like energy to days like that and um as a you know community organization we do a lot of work that supports some of this stuff we do um green infrastructure education and gardening programs and a lot of stuff that's really aligned and so I could really see the, the ecology center being a support for our local schools who are um, kind of unsure where to start and figuring out what to do with their students. Um, I think something I'd like to see with these uh, climate action days is like a way for students, for schools to maybe even be paired with a um, educator, similar to what happens with Day in the Life where, um, schools who are interested in participating can submit um, an application and 
there is kind of a process for partnering them with organizations to support them. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for all these answers. Um, and I agree. I'm I'm actually pretty excited for these climate action days. Um, as a part of Waterfront Alliance, of course, we'll be participating in the Water Day. Um, so figuring that out, but we're really excited for it to happen. Um, but one kind of overarching theme that I'm kind of feeling from all of your answers is that while these climate action days are exciting, they are, of course, a first step. And with that being said, we can kind of see other steps that maybe the city and state could take, uh, maybe looking to other states as an influence, such as New Jersey or Connecticut. Um, so leading into our last question, uh, what are the policy changes you would recommend to improve uh, both the uptake and quality of climate edu excuse me, climate education programs in New York City and New York State? I'm happy to jump in if no one wants to uh, first. Um, so as I mentioned before, our, our Climate and Resilience Education Task Force is really focusing on policy um, at the state level, um, mostly now. And we really have been studying the education system in New York State for a couple of years to really understand the, the infrastructure, the architecture of it, and who makes the decisions. and. Um, you know, we've learned that the Board of Regents is at the top and sets policy and New York State Department of Ed kind of implements those policies and then districts have the freedom to kind of imp implement, um, you know, curriculum. Um, but change is really slow. And I think we only change standards every 10 years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, change is very slow. And as we know, the climate crisis is accelerating and the science almost changes daily. So what we're working on, we had an intergenerational committee work over many, many months to draft a state climate education bill um, for New York State that we feel really addresses all of the key um, components that are needed um, in a bill. Um, they, those align with our climate education platform, which is posted on our website. And that includes um, you know, resources for teacher professional learning, um, teacher resource hub that we're working on, um, uh, funding for green workforce development, um, teacher pre-service training, um, and we're actually also suggesting the creation of a new office of climate education and workforce development. Um, we're not sure where that should be housed, probably out of NYSED, but we really feel that for New York's two and a half million students to you know, be ready for a climate changed world and for New York State to be able to meet its decarbonization goals, which are outlined in the Climate Act, which we fought to get climate education embedded into as well, that change has to come from the top. And even though we need a groundswell of people to demand it from the ground up, we also need to force our um, you know, antiquated education bureaucracy to be responsive to the urgency of this moment. So we are, um, looking for a, a sponsor now, a legislative sponsor for our draft bill um, and invite everyone to who's interested to work with us on that to help um, you know push it um, over the hill um, and um, and also to sign on to our climate education platform, which is on our website at CRETF.org. So um, that's what we're proposing. Thanks, Emily. It's very exciting. Um, it's really exciting and really excited to continue to kind of just like support this work. Um, I would say something that I think is also really important when we talk about climate education is it being interdisciplinary and it really like encompassing like all subjects. We tend to kind of um, put this climate education into like the science bucket. Um, but it's like so much more. Um, we know how valuable the intersection of of climate and climate justice and art is, is and understanding the history and the kind of social justice component to, um, I just think we can't ignore that. And really there should be standards in all subject areas and including standards that kind of, that cross over these subject areas. And 
I, I think it would be awesome if educators and teachers would have you know, time within their work day that's dedicated to training sessions and, you know, extra learning, because I feel like, you know, they, they always say there's not enough time. So I think if, you know, on those mandatory training days or staff days, or even, you know, an hour a week within their school group, having some kind of climate change education curriculum programming or, you know, something so that the teachers feel better equipped as well. And, you know, I think um, it would be awesome for the city and, and the DOE to rely on the partners that they already have in all of us to to help plan some of this or write and plan some of this curriculum and programming because, you know, this is already our wheelhouse and what we do. And so to actually have it endorsed by the city, I think would, would really go a long way also to get those teachers in the door um, and out on the streets and funding for these community partners. Oh, excellent, yeah, thank you for all of those answers. Um, so we are, we're actually a little early now. I think it's 1242 and I see one question in the Q&A box. Um, so yeah, we. it looks like Alex has a few questions. Um, so I'll just start with the first one. Um, so what are the goals of climate education? For example, like knowledge, action competence, civic engagement, um, self-efficacy. Um, yeah, what do you what do you all see as the goals of climate education? These could even just be goals like related within your own program areas. I mean, you know, I, I'm going to repeat myself maybe a little bit, but I think that really, obviously knowledge is important, but I, I really think student interest and inquiry and relying on local um, occurrences. You know, I think we we're now in a transition phase where even just a few years ago, climate change that was something that was going to happen in the future and for future generations. And now I think it's extremely prevalent and relevant for all of us because we see it happening all the time, whether it's like, you know, in immense flooding or smoke in the skies from wildfires in Canada um, and, you know, longer and hotter heat waves in the city and thinking about redlining and, and the economic, socioeconomic disparity in neighborhoods that were historically redlined and now are actually almost 10 degrees hotter because they don't have the, they haven't had community resources. So I think education, knowledge is, is really important for all of that, but also um, getting students to find what they are interested in and also want to want to work on, right? So thinking about the problems that they feel like they can tackle. And so looking at it maybe a little bit more piecemeal um, and not just, you know, we, we're not going to fix climate change in one sixth grade curriculum unit, but thinking about how students themselves can figure out what they, what they wanna do and, and taking action um, based uh, lessons and and creating something, investigating something on their own, and really again making it personal and making it local. Well, I feel like your answer actually segues perfectly into the second part of this question, which is how should the success of climate education be evaluated in both formal and non formal settings? I can take that only because I mean we've been lucky enough to have. Uh, some grant support that allows us to have formal evaluation. Um, and it really is based on teacher observations of student learning and the impact on students, um, you know, about what they're, what they're learning about. And I think what's been nice to see is that students feel empowered by the, by, by knowledge. And so that goes back to part of Alex's first question, which is like, what is the goal of climate education, yes, knowledge, and also empowerment. I think um, empowerment to kind of overcome some of the climate anxiety that we know students are experiencing, um, as well as self-efficacy and feeling that 
they can make a difference, that there's options out there um, for them to get involved in their community to actually make a difference locally. Um, and that's part of civic engagement. And I know Alex knows a lot about these topics because he um, hosts panels about these topics as well. Um, but yeah, I think that there's de definitely different ways to evaluate programming. I think pre and post surveys of teacher and student um, you know, um, learning and impact are also really important. And we've done kind of both um, and they're both really helpful to help improve um, on what you're doing. We can go into the, the third part of Alex's question as well. So how do all of your organizations collaborate internationally? Um, for example, supporting climate education action in countries that are maybe less resourced than New York City. And if you don't um, do any sort of collaboration internationally, do you see your organization maybe like five years, 10 years down the line uh, do you see that being a potential? I hate to speak more, but our um, National Wildlife Federation is the sole U.S. host of the Eco Schools program, which is in, um, I think, 70 countries now. And we do a lot of cross-cultural exchanges. So there was a time when we were collaborating with um, Taiwan and students there to do like cross-cultural learning. They picked the students picked a theme that they wanted to focus on, which was, um, I think it was schoolyard habitats and the di different projects and then shared with each other. And there was a 12 hour time difference. So it was a little challenging to be on Skype with, um, you know, one group was at night and the other group was in the early morning, but it was really interesting to hear kind of like the cultural differences between, um, you know, the students over there and the students over here. And there's, we do encourage students in the US to partner with students in other countries so that they can do cross-cultural exchanges and learn from each other. Um, that's kind of what we do. The um, Eco Schools program is managed by the Foundation for Environmental Education, which is based in Denmark, so. Yes, and speaking of Denmark, um, through a partnership with Copenhagen, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection published a cloudburst resiliency and planning study in 2017. And while that's not necessarily with the education office, the DEP looked at some of the stormwater management that was taking place in Copenhagen and is trying to implement similar um, strategies here in New York City in like NYCHA housing. So that's something that's exciting that is an international, you know, collaboration of study. Excellent. If uh, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to start moving through uh, some more. And I saw this one that I really think, really sh think should be addressed. So can you tell us more about climate anxiety and our students? And what are some of the tools you are using to move from climate anxiety to climate hope? Yeah, I think uh, climate anxiety is very real. I think we all as adults also um, experience it. And so first step is learning, it, it's finding tools as adults to deal with it. Um, but I really think that it is so great to highlight um, the stories of like leaders in our communities and the successes that they have had and looking at just again telling success stories um and also giving youth specific like ways that they can also take action too i think that it, that tends to make us all kind of feel better when we know we're not just like um kind of stuck you know we we can work together um in community and um and take action steps to find solutions. So just really empowering students to kind of be part of these solutions and highlighting success stories of other leaders in our community. It is hard. Yeah, and I think um, also, you know, focusing on smaller actions that students can do, um, you know, when thinking about uh, 
stormwater and and you know bigger bigger storms more storms more frequently like how students can can band together to create change and you know reduce flooding in their area or reduce combined sewer overflow by planting gardens or you know um, thinking about their water use but then also also really encouraging students this is something that I always try to do um, when talking about this is that it's, it's individual action is really important, but we need to push the government to make these changes as well. And so really getting students civically engaged and involved um, on their, in their local, you know, with their local council member or, you know, thinking smaller again, like not necessarily going to Mayor Adams or, you know, Governor Hochul, but, you know, thinking about where their, their neighborhoods their communities can actually um, impact the city and and the folks responsible for that and and really really uh, doing their student best and trying to get them involved as well. Yeah, I think action is the antidote to anxiety, and um, it's engaging students in you know opportunities to make a difference in their community. And I think that's always empowering and re seems to reduce anxiety. We also have um, tried to incorporate some social emotional learning um, tools in the risk curriculum. There's something called the listening exchange where we, um, that was designed by our author friend, Tom Roderick, um, who was the head of the Morningside Center for Social Responsibility for many years. And it's basically the students get paired with each other. And for five minutes, one student can talk about anything that they're feeling um, with no interruptions, and then they switch. And even if that one student is not gonna say anything for what seems like a lot of time, um, eventually, you know, something will come out. And it just, it's also kind of sharpens the, the skill of listening, which is something that I think we all don't, you know, we, go, we could all improve upon. Um, and sharing your feelings, which is we don't do enough of, I think, in, in education. So that seems to provide a space for students to unload some of the feelings that they may be having. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, action is the antidote to anxiety should be. And every environmental education program should be the, our motto, our logo. I should see that everywhere. That's such a good line. Um, and kind of leads into this next question that Gregory's asked. And Gregory, I'm going to condense your question a little bit. Um, so he asks, how can we advocate for more time for science, especially at the elementary level? Well, I will say I totally agree. Um, I mean, even I went to school in, in Brooklyn and public schools and I had science two days a week. You know, my science teacher brought in a cart and we did science. But I think one way to tackle that is to embed science education into all other disciplines. And so really thinking about what Jen said earlier and making this interdisciplinary. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes about environmental education is that all education is environmental education. Like this is not just science. This is not just environmental education. It really can be embedded um, even in terms of ELA and, um, you know, like having students read articles about climate change as part of their ELA instead of their science. And so really um, re reiterating those skills and, and focusing on all of that um, thinking about history and redlining and, you know, making it from, for all ages, you know, math and thinking about graphs and, and looking at change over time. Um, so I think um, all of these, all of these ways are, are ways that we can push for incremental bits of climate and science being in um, getting students more embedded in it throughout their, all of their, all of I'm sorry, all of their curriculum, all of the, the um, work that they're doing in schools. And then, of course, um, really thinking about how do we get the funding? You know, I think it it's always comes down to a funding issue in terms of, of add-ons like science um, or art or gym class. Like, we really need to um, get that um, the funding there so that students can have access to better and more science education.
All right, I think we have time for one more question and there's a lot of good ones. Let's see. Um, yeah, I think we'll we'll end with this question. So which New York City frontline communities are being engaged in climate education? And then what are the some like what are some of the challenges in engaging these communities? I can speak a little bit about this, you know, at the Lower East Side Ecology Center, um, you know, the Lower East Side was um, really impacted by Hurricane Sandy and community residents. They, you know, they remember that. They don't forget something like that. And um, it still continues to impact people. And so I think you know, residents in our community, they they really feel the significance of um, climate change, and they know that um, it's vulnerable. And so, I think there's like a, there's also a lot of opportunity there because there are a lot of really engaged um, community leaders. Uh, we work with um, some of the some other like community organizations um, that are led by like the uh, NYCHA, like Tenant Association president, and they really have a lot of insight on um, kind of what people need. So I think there's a lot of op opportunity because the, these are communities where there are people with voices um, and that are ready to be heard and are ready to um, really partner and work together on building resiliency within the within the community. Um, but I also think that some of these communities are also, you know, are, have been historically redlined communities or face a lot of other like kind of socioeconomic challenges. And so sometimes, for example, when we're doing like composting education, um, it can be challenging when you have um, when you have folks who have, can, you know, they have other needs and people are trying to, you know, feed their families and pay their bills and maybe working multiple jobs. Um, it can be difficult to get them to um, really have just the time and the capacity to like learn about green infrastructure or composting or some of these things that like are really relevant and useful. Um, but again, like I said, I think there, there's a lot of really, really engaged voices in these communities too, and so much opportunity um, to just work alongside community leaders. Yeah, and I would add, we've been working in Coney Island with community partners since 2020. Um, and you know, we have actually a film premiere on Saturday that highlights um, our partners in Coney Island and what folks um, there have gone through since Sandy and are still dealing with after effects of Sandy. And I think um, what we found is that the expertise lies in the communities. And when you're working in communities, you have to listen to what people are saying, what they need and what they know um, and to lift that up um, because sometimes they don't have the capacity, um, you know, to, to do that, but they certainly do have um, the expertise and the knowledge of what their community needs and, and the, the resilience of the community. Um, uh, so it's been a privilege to, to partner, um, in Coney Island with the folks there. And, um, we hope to continue, um, working in that community for a long time to come. All right. Uh, not to interrupt this incredible conversation, but we are at time. Um, so I want to thank all of the panelists for sharing your insights. This was an incredible conversation. And thank you to the attendees for attending. Um, we did record this. Um, so in a follow-up email, we can send out the recording of it, along with a lot of the events and the organizations that all the panelists work for. I know that there were a couple of questions about um, some of the groups that they're involved with. So we'll try and get that information out to you uh, sometime in the coming weeks. But again, Thank you so much for attending and be sure to check out um, all the other events happening throughout Climate Week and the ones that Waterfront Alliance and other organizations across the city are hosting. So yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Bye, all. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right.